Um, but we'll have the session available uh, on JASCO's website uh, for you to review after the after the, the, the demonstration today, after the presentation today. Uh, I'll also have uh, time towards the end of the session for uh, Q&A, so if you have any questions, um, either put them into the chat window or um, you can take yourself off mute uh, at the end of the session. So again, thanks so much for joining me. Um, my name is Danny and I've been working with Windows Server since 2003. I didn't do much with Windows Server 2000 or with NT4 because I was a novel enthusiast at the time, but don't hold that against me. There have been jokes that my blood did run red uh, and now it runs blue. Um, so I missed out on all of the NT4 and Server 2000 fun uh, and the, the birth of Active Directory, but been managing servers uh, on and off and now in integration with Azure for more than 15 years. And, and today I want to show you more, hopefully, of, of what you can do with some of the, the new stuff that's coming from Microsoft. Uh, some of the stuff's been there for a bit, but there have been some updates to this recently. And there's there's always a, a lot of interest in uh, server management and Windows Server in, in general, whether in Azure or on-premises or on a, another platform. So what I wanted to cover off today, I wanted to go through and have a look at uh, hopefully a bit of a fun brief history of management and some of the challenges that we have there. Uh, talk a little bit about what Azure Monitor is and uh, what it can do for you and and then have a look at Azure Monitor run through a demo. So I want today to be fairly demo heavy um, and probably get a not deep technical, but uh, probably high level technical. Uh, I want to talk a little bit then about where Windows Admin Center came from, what Windows Admin Center is, is trying to, to do uh, within server management and then run through uh, the, the Windows Admin Center uh, demo with you. And then we'll have time, as I mentioned at the end, for question and answer. So let's let's take a look at a, a brief history of, of server management and what has changed since Windows 2000. And this console might look a little bit familiar to you. Um, and if you missed that, I'll go back again. That was Active Directory users and computers in Windows Server 2000. And this is Active Directory users and computers in Windows Server 2016. Uh, the icons are a little bit prettier, but for all intents and purposes, it's the same console. Um, did anyone remember the, the Active Directory Administrative Center? Uh, did you actually even know that it existed? Did you use it? Um, the server manager is something you're also probably familiar with and, and you might have used. And th these, these were consoles that kind of came along the way that uh, Microsoft's approach was to try and bring uh, everything together into one console. But generally what happened was uh, you hit a brick wall pretty quickly uh, in terms of what you could do from that one console, and then this is what happened. Uh, the result was that you had to launch all of these different consoles to, to manage your environment. So why, um, why would we want to look at uh, changing some of the things that we have been doing? Because those tools do work. Um, they're, they're still used by everyone. There, there are some key areas that I, I think might be of value. Uh, so around security, uh, for one, uh, if you want to limit RDP access to servers, uh, limit ports open on your servers and reduce your surface area of attack. You might also have some compliance requirements uh, around server management uh, where you don't want people to be doing things in a certain way uh, by you know, RDPing to servers. You might want to run or you might currently run server core. Uh, you want to limit the application installs, uh, installations. Again, reduce your surface area of attack. Uh, you might want to stop people browsing the web on servers. Um, you know, and limit the, the potential for accidental uh, malware installations while people are provisioning servers. Um, you know, if, if someone downloads a RDPs to a server, downloads a password generation tool that contains malware and then runs that, and that might install and infect the server before you've had a chance to get any of your other security software on there. There's, there's also a cost and efficiency component to this um, where People RDPing to servers or connecting to servers, uh, multiple profiles are going to consume memory and disk space on those servers. And that's that's memory and disk that you really want to be dedicated to those, those servers, uh, to the applications running on those servers, um, rather than to the people managing those servers. Because how many times have you RDPed to a server and you see you know, 10 disconnected sessions consuming memory um, on, the, on that environment, on that server? One of the other advantages that you might want to get out of, of using these tools is uh, by using one console instead of those you know, 15 or so different consoles that we saw. But the one console to have some capability to extend beyond, beyond uh, the, the standard components, to give you more capability. 
Uh, you want to give people a, a simple and consistent interface rather than um, rather than navigating those those different management consoles and and reduce the number of installed applications on either a management computer or um, individual servers. And there's some other reasons you might want to start using new management tools, uh, simpler requirements, um, some of the features, uh, feature sets that you might want to use. Uh, you want to improve your capability. Uh, you want a lighter footprint um, rather than installing a bunch of consoles on either a jump box or on all the you know remote server administration tools on people's computers. Uh, you might want to move from that distributed model, so instead of people connecting to a server, RDPing to a server to manage that server, to going back to that distributed to a centralized model. Uh, some of you might already be doing that right now with um, where you have your consoles installed on a central jump box, or you might be using the remote server administration tools. Um, increased capability. When I when I mentioned that I'm talking about things like uh, improving uh, change tracking information, notifications, uh, you might want to get some insights on capacity uh, that's happening on servers. And there's also an integration bit with uh, with the tools uh, around things like uh, Azure Backup uh, and Azure Updates, uh, to to name a couple, uh, where you might want to integrate those components um, rather than using on-premises versions. So, and, and what can you manage with the new tools that we're going to look at today? You can manage uh, on-premises uh, VMs, you can manage Azure VMs, you can manage VMs that are pretty much on any platform where we can install an agent or feed this information into, um, into Azure Monitor or connect to from, from the Windows Admin Center. All right, so what is Azure Monitor? So Azure Monitor basically takes uh, information from the sources that you see on the left, so application, operating system, all of those things. We take metrics and logs from those systems, and we, out of that, grab uh, insights, visualizations, uh, have the chance to an an analyze data, uh, respond in a certain way to that, that data, and also integrate with other systems. The, the bits that I want to cover off today uh, are around uh, virtual machine insights. We'll have a quick look at some of the dashboards, uh, so some of those visualizations that might be useful. Um, some of the things you can do with log analytics very briefly, because we could spend a whole hour just on that easily. Um, and then how, how to respond to some of the alerting uh, capabilities uh, around Azure Monitor. So what better way uh, for me to show you what Azure Monitor is uh, by jumping into a demo? And that's Azure Monitor. Um, oops, sorry about that. Let me just flick across. So the, the Azure Monitor page, I've just logged into an Azure subscription here. There are some agents that I have installed uh, on my on-premises servers. I have uh, three on-premises servers, I think, and one Azure server communicating with this, this test environment. The, the Azure machine uses an extension uh, to send that information into Azure Monitor. Um, and I'm collecting uh, some of the standard event logging and performance metrics uh, from those servers. So what I wanted to, to start with was to, uh, to very quickly show you one of the dashboards that comes out of the box uh, when you install uh, or you enable some of these components. So uh, the service map security and audit, um, Azure activity log information, so everything that I do in Azure is audited and, and can be fed into Azure Monitor, and in my case, system update assessment. Some change tracking information, and I apologize for the infrastructure insights that's currently in, in preview, uh, but that information is not feeding into my dashboard. And from there, I can, I can drill down into that dashboard uh, to get some more meaningful information. In this case, about updates that are required on my machines um, that are reporting back to, to Azure Monitor. So I just wanted to give you a very quick idea of, of that visualization. Uh, Let's jump into the virtual machines preview. This is in a uh, technical preview at the moment. The health component in particular right now is just feeding information from my Azure virtual machine. And the whole point of this dashboard is just to give me uh, an overall summary uh, of my environment and how, uh, and how healthy it is. Um, more importantly, performance metrics 
uh, within the environment, most of you will have seen monitoring systems that provide this, this type of information uh, where we get top end charts for things like CPU utilization, available memory, some network traffic information and, and logical disk information. And you can see here when I hover over any point in, in one of those graphs, it, it will give me some detailed information uh, for the servers that are reporting back and, and the metric at that, um, at that point. Again, I can change the, the time range to something more meaningful so I can go uh, you know, to a custom time range if I want to investigate uh, an anomaly with my my servers or something that um, that has gone wrong to try and correlate, you know, what some of those uh, performance metrics were were doing at that time. The service map uh, is something uh, that I find of, of uh, interest when you're visualizing, and I'll just choose a computer here. Uh, even though that says 2016-1, it's it is actually a 2019 server. This is a, a good example of why you shouldn't name your servers based on the operating system, because occasionally you do do in-place upgrades. The service map, uh, what you're seeing on the screen here, um, is a, a visualization of the communication of this server uh, from computers or devices that are communicating with this server and the ports that this server is communicating out on. Um, and so I can get some, some useful information here uh, about how this server is, is communicating. And I'll just change my port list here to include LDAP port 389. Apply that config and that'll appear in my list. And the whole point here is I can uh, very quickly and easily get a, an indication of uh, the communication path, uh, the service map, if, if you will, of this server. Um, and how it's communicating to other services within my environment. I can also customize that view if I wanted to target just Azure services versus in my environment. Uh, I'm doing both Azure servers and uh, on-premises servers. Uh, drilling down a little bit more, uh, there's some performance um, performance visualizations uh, that will give me some uh, some information. Just waiting for that to load, and this view. Uh, gives me a slightly different view to before. Again, I can I can customize my time range, uh, but the top view, uh, top end view concept, but this time giving me the, the capability to look at um, averages, uh, percentiles uh, to see how my, my servers are tracking. So in this case, if we looked at uh, processor time, uh, we can see what the average process um, usage uh, for this server over the last four hours is versus the 95th percentile versus the, the maximum. And I can do that for um, for any of those other uh, performance counters as well to, to get an indication. And that's also available for the, the individual uh, metrics that we're looking at for each of those servers. So logical disk space, network information, uh, memory and CPU utilization, those, those core options. There's, there's a lot more information here, but the only other one I wanted to show you in the uh, the virtual machines preview is the, the open ports um, visualization. And, and this is really useful. And, and the benefit of visualizations, again, when you're when you're troubleshooting anomalies or you're looking through history of a server to try and determine cause of an event or, or something like that, uh, or you want to be alerted about a certain um, event, the visualizations are really useful to determine um, you know, differences in patterns. In this case, we can clearly see um, the number of open ports on my HV01P server is 64, whereas my other three servers, it's kind of 15 to 19 uh, seems to be the normal. So if I click on that, uh, I'm going to be able to drill down and see what's causing that. Um, in my case, it's pretty easy to see that all of those, are, or the, the difference there is the DPMRA. That uses a lot of random ports, uh, random high ports. It uses the remote uh, procedure call um, mapping to connect to, uh, to service for backup. That's kind of normal. It's not a lot I can do about that, but I, at least I can very quickly and easily see if that's something that I should be concerned about. One of the other interesting things here is the um, the bytes uh, sent and received based on on each of those processes. Uh, so in my 2016-2 server, I can see that port 5985, which is a system process, seems to be sending and receiving quite a bit of data in the last 24 hours compared to other processes on that system. And the uh, port 5985, while it's a system process, I know that's uh, WMI and, and WinRM. Uh, that's that's probably doing that, and that's probably because I've been using the Windows Admin Center quite a bit um, for for visualize or or get, um, garnering information uh, from that server. 
So that's kind of normal, but it's a very handy way or a very good way to, to visualize uh, some of these things in the environment and, and the Azure monitor makes it uh, reasonably easy to do that. The other bit I wanted to show you was if we delve a little bit into uh, tech geeky side is the uh, the log analytics uh, component where um, any uh, not any monitoring system, but a lot of monitoring systems, you can generate alerts, create workflows based on um, the, the change to um, the state of a of a metric. So if, if our disk space is lower than 5% uh, available, we want to send a critical alert to something or we want to action something, we want to action a, a startup script. The benefit of feeding a lot of this performance and event information and log information into Azure Monitor means we can do a little bit, um, a little bit more. And one of the things I wanted to show you today was the the change tracking uh, component. So this is called configuration change, and I just want to point out that uh, I'm not an expert on the Custo query language, which is what uh, Azure Monitor uses. Um, but it's very good at giving me information uh, or giving me the options for what I can fill out to reasonably quickly uh, determine uh, the information that I, I want to gather. So I'm going to go ahead and summarize the count. I want to get a summary of what all of my configuration changes are so that we can drill a little bit deeper, find out what's going on. So I'm going to do that by configuration change type. And I'm going to get a summary back that in the last 24 hours we can see in our time range up here. Uh, that I have uh, 373 Windows service changes and six software changes. So I want to drill a little bit down, deeper down and find out what those software changes are. So I'm going to say where the config change type uh, equals software. And no space in software. And that's going to give me uh, all of the, the software changes that have happened in the last 24 hours. Um, that's that's not enough. I also want to go back where the um, the time generated. I want to go back 14 days uh, in my history. Um, 14 days, there we go. And I'll run that query. So this is going to give me a lot more information. And you can see in the, the software type column, a lot of those are updates. I don't want to know about updates. I want to know about other software changes, applications that have been installed or removed from my, my server. I could summarize on updates, but that's that's not my focus at the moment. So what I want to go and have a look at now is um, where the software type does not equal update. And run that query. You can see how quickly this, this information comes back to me. And I've immediately filtered down to software that's been added and, and removed to this server. There's quite a bit of information there. So the last thing I'll do here is I just want to get the, the information that's meaningful to me. So I want to look at the time generated, uh, the computer, the change category, uh, the software title, so that's software name, uh, the previous state, and I want to grab the, the current state. So what it was before and what it is now or at the time of the change, I should say. So I'll run that query and pretty quickly I get information back uh, that's far more meaningful. I can see that the Windows Admin Center was not installed. I installed version 12.5. I removed it from that, uh, from server 2019-01, excuse me, and then I added that back in. Now from there, I can go ahead and save that alert. Uh, so that I can go ahead and rerun that uh, query without having to figure it all out again in the future. Or I can go ahead and I can just go and create an alert rule based on that. So clicking new alert rule, we'll go ahead. Here's my query already in the alert rule. That's the query that we just defined. Um, I'm looking for any event of a software change on a server, and I want to be notified uh, over a period of 60 minutes and basically once every 60 minutes, and I'm done. So I can go ahead and create an, an action, and my action customize the email, um, but my action is, do I want to notify people via email? Do I want to create a, uh, a particular workflow or an action? Do I want to use the automation components uh, within Azure Monitor to kick off an action now that that event has occurred? Um, and that's how easy it is to, to go ahead and create some alerts.
So let's, um, that's, that's probably all I want to show you. There's a lot more to Azure Monitor um, that we could cover off. That's, that's all I'll show you uh, today. And let's head back into uh, the presentation. Uh, so now I want to talk about Windows Admin Center, where did it come from and what it can do for you. So Windows Admin Center kind of came about uh, in 2000 and I think it was a 2017. There we go, September 22nd, 2017. Technical preview was available. Um, I investigated this or I started working with this kind of around when Windows Server 2019 was in technical preview. And I was interested in this because I, I wanted a different way to manage servers, but I didn't want that same experience that I'd had before with the Active Directory Administration Center with the server manager, where it was just another console that would be, you know, spawning a bunch of other consoles. So I set myself a challenge to, to try and prove how good the Windows Admin Center would be or that, at that stage, uh, Project Honolulu. And what I did is I, I built up a technical preview server 2019 server and Install the server. It got an IP address from uh, DHCP, and from that point onwards, I wanted to completely configure the server to act as, say, a file server without going to the console once. That was a challenge I set myself, and I got pretty close in in just tech with technical preview software. Um, so that's what uh, Windows, where Windows Admin Center came from. But what is Windows Admin Center? So what Microsoft defined Windows Admin Center as is a, a lightweight management solution for smaller scale deployments, um, or it's an ad hoc management uh, tool for large scale deployments. It's meant to have familiar MMC functionality, which you'll see in a minute. It's not meant to replace uh, more advanced management uh, tools you might have in your environment already, such as you know if you're using a System Center Configuration Manager or System Center Operations Manager, or if previously you were using the operations management suite or Azure Monitor, but it's meant to complement those. Uh, it also has security that integrates with on-premises Active Directory, or if you want to, you can extend that to uh, some Azure Active Directory uh, security. So when we talk about uh, what it's meant to be from a, uh, from a lightweight perspective or what Microsoft's approach there is, uh, lightweight and fast deployment, the Windows Admin Center, uh, is a small installer, about 60 megabytes. Uh, you can install that in minutes uh, on a server. It has a gateway component and a web server component. The admin center gateway communicates with uh, your existing servers using uh, PowerShell and WMI over WinRM. There's no agent installation required on those servers. On some of uh, your older servers, if you're looking to manage uh, maybe 2008 R2 or 2012, you might have to update the management components uh, or the PowerShell components on there to bring them up to a level that Windows Admin Center needs, but there's no separate agent. Uh, you can then connect from a, a modern web browser. Um, we'll look at what that means in a second uh, over HTTPS. And at that point, you can manage your environment. You don't need, uh, and it's a question that often comes up with Windows Admin Center, you don't need an internet connection uh, to manage your environment from that point onwards. However, if you want to, you can go ahead and you can publish because this is all HTTPS based, publish that to uh, public DNS, um, either open your firewall or use a technology such as um, the Azure AD application proxy uh, to add multi-factor authentication to that. So you've got a secure method of remotely accessing and managing uh, your, your server environment. Uh, from a, a deployment option capability, uh, what you can see on the screen at the moment, uh, We've got a bunch of flexible deployment options we can install on the Windows Admin Center itself on Windows Server, semi-annual channel release 2019, 2016, or Windows 10. You can access from Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome are the recommended browsers. Uh, you'll see me today using Microsoft Edge Chromium, uh, which is different to Microsoft Edge Native, um, or I like to call it Edgium. I don't think that name is going to stick though. Um, anyway. From a management point of view, the managed nodes, you can go all the way from Windows Server, semi-annual channel release, uh, Server 2019, all the way down to 2008 R2 and Windows 10 as well. Um, it's interesting that 2008 R2 was a user request or user feedback request uh, to be able to be managed by Windows Admin Center, even though it's coming at end of life in January 2020. 
uh, but you can manage 2008 R2 um, in uh, servers through the Windows Admin Center as well. So that's enough about the Windows Admin Center. I'm going to jump into a demo and show you what you can do with it. Right, so this is the, the Windows Admin Center. It looks uh, pretty bland. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, and what you're seeing in front of you is just a, a list of the servers that I've got uh, to, to manage in my test environment here. There's a, I'll point out there's a, a personal section and a shared section. So Windows Admin Center gives you the capability to create a shared list uh, that you can pre-populate so that anyone who connects into your Windows Admin Center gateway who needs to or who is able to connect into your Windows Admin Center gateway server can, uh, can access that predefined list of servers without having to go ahead and add those. Uh, and that was that was uh, based on user feedback as well. That wasn't there at the beginning of the product. I just want to very quickly show you one of the the extensibility of extensible components of the Windows Admin Center and what Microsoft are trying to do a little bit differently to those other consoles um, that we looked at. So you'll see in this list there are a bunch of things that are Microsoft extensions and a bunch of things that are not Microsoft extensions. So if we look at um, you know Fujitsu Server View RAID. There's Lenovo X Clarity Integrator. Uh, there should be a uh, data on, I thought data on, yep, data on must visibility monitoring and management set. So these are uh, extensions. I don't have any of that hardware in my environment, unfortunately. Um, but those extensions give you the capability to add management into directly into the Windows Admin Center. So again, without having to go to a different console to manage that hardware solution um, or that software solution to be able to do it directly through the, the Windows Admin Center. Um, there's also an installed extensions list so that if there's an update to ex an extension to provide me with more capability, um, then I can go ahead, I can highlight that, verify that I'm, I'm happy with the, uh, the author of that. Um, that extension and go ahead and, and just update that extension. That'll cause the, the Windows Admin Center browser to close for everyone, uh, reopen, and then basically that ext in extension is in use. So let's uh, jump right in. And what I wanted to show you was some of the stuff that people might be doing day to day uh, in an environment where they would normally or might out of habit remote connect to a server. And, and where um, the, I'm not going to go through every option on the left hand side that you can see in that list. But I want to show you some of the ones that uh, people will probably commonly use. The uh, the main overview page I, I find very useful, and this is kind of uh, a little bit similar to some of the information that you might get, say, on the Windows Task Manager. This is updating in real time, and I want to put this in perspective. Um, if you look at the the model of the hardware that I'm running on here, this is not this is not quick hardware in my uh, in my virtualization environment. Some of you might recognize what that is um, and, and the fact that it says manufacturer IBM instead of Lenovo. Uh, but the the real time uh, information that I'm getting uh, from my server akin to, to what you'd see in the task manager useful for seeing what's happening on that server right now. And that's generally what some people do when they, they launch or they're troubleshooting a server or looking to try and determine what might be causing application slowdown or whatever. These are, these are some of the things that we look at. Um, we can also get some uh, some disk metrics as well. Uh, to help us identify what our um, what, what is happening with disk. Uh, Microsoft recommend that, um, that or warn you that disk enabling disk metrics can cause increased uh, overhead. Uh, so only to enable that when you need to. Uh, you'll notice up on the top right when I did that um, that I get a notification list. So I get a history in my session of what I've done. Um, and the benefit of this is if I click on something uh, without having to sit there and wait for the, the status change. I might want to go on and do different things. If that task or that request that I made succeeded or failed, I can go back and look in my notification history um, on that. And that's very useful. And some of the things that you'll see as, as we work through the, the console. Uh, so from here, I can do things like uh, not just view information, I can change the computer name. Um, I can restart this server, I can shut down this server, and I can also manage alerts. And, and manage alerts will then integrate this server's alerting information, its performance information into uh, Azure Monitor. 
and I'll see if this will work. Um, nope, I'm having a problem signing in there, so we'll skip past that. Um, my my environment, I'm using a different um, uh, a different set of credentials that's connecting, uh, or a different DNS uh, UPN that's connecting to my local environment to to Azure, and I think it's trying to pass through uh, that authentication. That's that's why that's failing. Um, so there's a, a hybrid service component here that's built into Windows Admin Center. Um, and it's a shame I can't show you those those hybrid services, but one of those is the the backup server. So if we have a look at Azure Backup, uh, where I can natively integrate or natively backup my server directly to Azure, and I can monitor that status through the Windows Admin Center. So I've already gone through and I've uh, configured a backup task uh, on my Hyper-V server. I can see uh, I've had seven successes, 179 recovery points in total in Azure. I can see my most recent job status. Um, I could even kick off a backup now or stop a running backup if I needed to um, without having to leave this console, without having to go to that server and do that. I'd like to see some more stuff um, in this console, but at the moment in terms of uh, information uh, that's being presented to me, I could also go and have a look at more detailed information on the recovery points and jobs. Um, a lot of this stuff is being developed and you'll see in a lot of cases towards the top here that a lot of these features are in preview and they are continually being developed um, at the moment. One of the other components or the, that I didn't mention before uh, that I should have uh, in, in an integration with Azure that you can configure uh, directly from uh, the Windows Admin Center is a uh, an Azure VPN feature. So basically that's the, the capability to uh, connect my virtual machine or my physical machine directly to an Azure network without having to have a firewall um, take care of that for me. And also the capability there with, with Azure File Sync to, to synchronize files uh, from an Azure source down to a, a local file server. So there, there's some of the integration capabilities that are, that are there. Uh, some of the other things that people generally tend to do on the servers where they have to remote connect to a server. Uh, people look at the event log to determine what's happened uh, with an application or, or with the system. Uh, if they want to go ahead and filter on an event ID uh, to look for uh, you know, a specific type of event uh, that occurred in a, in a time frame. So that, that functionality is all available through Windows Admin Center. You can see that it's very responsive. Um, all of my applications and services logs um, will show in that list as well. I don't have any cloud backup logs there at the moment. Oops, probably because I've got a filter in. There we go, that's better. So if I wanted to filter on any um, uh, warnings that have occurred, I can go ahead and have a look in my cloud backup for event ID 14, and then I get uh, all of the warning events. So very responsive, um, very easy way of looking at, at event logs um, on my remote server. Um, the firewall rules is one that I really like because it's just so easy to use. Uh, if you've used the advanced uh, Windows firewall on a, or the advanced Windows firewall console on any server, the functionality is basically the same. So incoming and outgoing rules, I can go ahead and create uh, rules and I get all of the, the functionality that I would normally expect um, when I'm creating a rule. And I could go ahead and step through that wizard, but let's let's have a look at, at an existing rule just so that you get a, an appreciation of all of the options that I have that are available um, through the Windows Admin Center. We're not losing any functionality here. Everything that I can do with the firewall rule um, on the, the console, I can do through the Windows Admin Center. And one of the things I really like about this is, is when I want to go in and filter on, say, uh, file and print sharing. Um, there are all of my file and print sharing uh, rules. I can go ahead, highlight that rule, and just go ahead, disable it. It gives me my notification, tells me that, yep, we successfully disabled that rule. Um, it didn't change the action here. That should have changed to blocked. Um, but the, the tab here has changed. Uh, might submit that via feedback, but I can go ahead and, and disable and enable rules uh, easily. What I'd like to see um, is the capability, and I'll, I'll submit this as feedback, would be to, to do this for multiple rules rather than having to do it individually. But again, that, that same capability is there without me having to go uh, to the console. I'm just going to flip across to a Windows Server 2019 server. I should have pointed out that that was a 2012 R2 server. Um, and the reason why I want to do this is I want to show you that not all servers are created equal. Um, 
and while there there are some things that I would love to be able to do with Windows Admin Center on older servers, but the capability is is baked into the operating system. And one of those is System Insights, which is an an absolutely fantastic addition to Server 2019. The whole point here with System Insights is so that I can get an idea of um, when the resources on a server or a virtual machine are not going to run out or haven't surpassed a particular metric. So a metric. So I'm not going to get notified, you know, if my disk space is 90% or 95%. Um, I'm going to try and do some intelligent forecasting based on usage patterns and I'll open up the volume consumption forecasting so you can see that. Um, and it's telling me that on this particular volume that it's forecasting that volume to run out of capacity in 19 days. So I might want to look at that and do something, do something about that now. And this information um, can be fed into Azure Monitor so that you can alert on that information from Azure Monitor rather than having to, to come through uh, to the console. So you can see there based on um, this pattern on the 11th of July, there was a, a steep increase. And then on the 20th of July, we had another fairly steep increase. It did drop off a bit, but there's a chance given that history that uh, will continue to increase. Um, we're seeing a pattern of increase and within 19 days, we might hit 100% capacity. So we want to do something about that now. That's not based on a fixed metric. This is based on a pattern of usage, which, which can be very useful. And that's, that's available for um, CPU utilization, storage and, and network forecasting. So that's a great feature of Server 2019 and one reason why you might want to upgrade to Server 2019 amongst all of the other things. Uh, jumping to, to networking is an area where I think that um, there's room for improvement. Apart from the fact that I've got this, this button here which says add Azure Network Adapter, uh, which is in preview at the moment. Um, but the capability there of me to be able to, from this server, directly connect it to Azure. If I've got uh, the Azure side of things set up, um, or if I want to connect to an existing Azure virtual network, uh, this will install the gateway, connect this server to that gateway. Um, and of course, there might be some firewall rule changes I need to make in Azure to allow communication. But this is a way of um, allowing a single server or a couple of servers in your environment, depending on the size of your organization. If you don't want to have to have a site to site um, firewall connection to enable communication with Azure. This is a way of getting individual server communication. Useful for branch office if you're using technologies such as Azure File Sync. Uh, from a, um, a network management point of view on this server, we, we are uh, limited a little bit um, by what we can do. So not as much as I'd like to see. We've got the, the basic um, IP settings and DNS settings that we can change, but not, um, not the, the more advanced settings. We do get uh, a little bit of information down here under detail that might be useful to you if people are, again, are looking at um, uh, troubleshooting a server, looking for server and for IP information, um, you know, link speed, those types of things. But certainly room for improvement uh, on that one. Uh, processes. Uh, is a handy one, a handy area to, to be able to troubleshoot um, process information, stop and start processes, uh, some very useful information about a process, uh, disk information, where that, what executable or what binaries that process is calling, uh, memory utilization, those types of things. The, the registry, again, these, these are things that I'm expecting people to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, being able to remotely or from the one console, go ahead and manage the uh, the registry uh, on a server in, in the way that you normally would. Uh, the only feature that I think is really missing from here uh, is the capability to, to search um, for, for registry keys and values, uh, which I miss. That, that's one thing that I miss. Uh, from a services point of view, this is probably something people do do more often if you have a problem with a service uh, or you need to change uh, the, the impersonation of a service. Um, again, if we wanted to look for the health service, Microsoft monitoring agent, um, go and have a look at the settings, pause or stop that service, change the, uh, the logon um, credentials for that service and what to do in recovery. So the capability from a, a service management point of view is very similar to what you'd be used to doing uh, on, a, on, on the server console. 
Uh, storage is one that I like, but I might skip past that because I want to show you um, storage and clustering. So I've got a storage spaces direct cluster here that I'm going to very quickly connect to. As I remember the password. All right, and um, we'll jump into volumes in a section in a second. But uh, what I wanted to show you first was just that, from a management point of view, earlier on I talked about where Windows Admin Center fits into managing uh, virtualization. So Hyper-V um, servers within your environment or Hyper-V clusters. It's not to, meant to replace a virtual machine manager where you have some very um, heavy requirements for management, some very deep technical reasons why you're using SCVMM, but certainly a lot of the capability within uh, managing either standalone Hyper-V servers or clusters is available through the Windows Admin Center. So I get a great summary uh, overview of of how my environment's looking, uh, utilization of CPU and memory, storage utilization, my virtual machine state, all of that type of stuff. If I drill down into my virtual machines, I'm gonna get, a again, another summary page of the health of those uh, virtual machines, and I'm gonna flick straight across into inventory because I wanna show you that from a capability point of view, um, th what I can do with this server. So if you're used to, managing, creating checkpoints, uh, exporting virtual machines, importing virtual machines, uh, setting up VM protection, moving virtual machines between nodes in a cluster or um, shutting down, uh, modifying the settings of virtual machines, anything that you would normally do within Hyper-V or the failover cluster manager, uh, modifying memory utilization, that's that server's using uh, too much memory, it's only a backup server, it doesn't need uh, memory anyway, right? Um, it's telling me I've got unsaved changes there uh, and I couldn't save the memory settings and it tells me why um, because the memory size well it partially completed and I think it's because I tried to go below what the server can actually give me so um, so I'll discard those changes it'd be interesting to see whether it actually dropped um, but all of the things that you're used to doing adding disks removing disks to virtual machines managing checkpoints modifying the boot order uh, is available through or you have the capability to do that within the, the Windows Admin Center. So if we have a look at um, at volumes and again we get some decent information about um, your IOs uh, per second on that volume, your, your average latency, your total throughput uh, and these are graphs that will update. You can see we can change the the period of time if we're looking for patterns within that uh, but from an inventory point of view uh, if I want to go ahead and say modify the size of this volume, um, I can go ahead and do that. If this was a volume that would support shrinking, um, I could go ahead and shrink that volume dynamically uh, straight away. So let's go and expand that volume size to 155 gig. Uh, that'll go ahead and, and do that for me. And it's successfully completed. My volume is now 155 gig. One of the other things I wanted to point out, and this is a server uh, 2019 uh, and 2016 feature, deduplication and compression. Uh, this is a Hyper-V uh, server on my storage spaces direct cluster shared volume. Uh, I've turned on deduplication and compression. I don't have something that supports integrity checksum, uh, but I've saved 48% uh, just by turning that on, on my virtual machines. Of course, there are some other um, considerations that you might want to take into account when you enable that the workloads that you're running, a bunch of other things. But certainly this is a great and easy way, and again, something that you can do directly from the Windows Admin Center to enable deduplication on, on servers and, and make a, a massive, in, in my case, you know, going from 100 gig down to, or oh, 96, uh, what, did, what did we go down to? My maths is horrible today, but 48% uh, <laughs> saving, roughly uh, 50 gig, 56.9 gig, sorry, right in front of me. So some, some very handy things that, that you can do and I'm running out of time and the last thing I want to show you here so that we have some time for, for questions at the end if, if there are any is some of the capabilities around um, domain management because those, those are consoles that um, we, we pointed out earlier on. Uh, if I go to my domain controller I can see I have uh, the option to manage DHCP create scopes. Uh, these were released, I think, in um, in March of this year. 
So they're still reasonably limited in what they can do. There's, there's some components um, that you would expect from an advanced management point of view that you, you cannot do right now. But most of the day-to-day -day stuff, um, adding, creating scopes, creating, um, uh, you know, the entries in those scopes uh, for supported um, DHCP options uh, are available. Uh, DNS the same. There's a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, my DHCP server looked a little bit bland because it's not doing DHCP right now. Uh, but if I, I can go ahead and uh, manage the forward lookup zones, reverse lookup zones, I can go and modify my records. I can create new DNS uh, entries. I can edit existing, uh, in this case, whoops, edit existing records um, to modify things like TTLs, the IP address for, for records, create C names, all of those types of things that are day-to-day -day, um, things that I would expect to be able to do uh, with, with DNS. And of course, Active Directory, again, the capability to do right now the, the basic functions, and I expect these to, to improve with more user feedback, and I can search um, my Active Directory domain, I can uh, browse that for users and groups, and then I can go ahead and I can modify, uh, reset passwords, enable or disable accounts, modify the, uh, the properties of accounts. All of those types of basic functions are available there. All right, let me flick back to the presentation uh, to, to close off. There's a lot more there in Windows Admin Center, um, but that's all we've got time to cover off today. So again, just to, to recap uh, some of the reasons why you might want to use the, the Windows Admin Center and uh, Azure Monitor. And we, we talked about these uh, right at the very, very start, and I won't go through each of the individual points, but the core reasons that I see, uh, particularly around assisting you to improve security, um, you know, limit or restrict what people are doing on, on servers or by remote connecting to those servers, improving efficiency by giving the capability for people to do, at the moment, probably, you know, 90% of the, their day to day through that one console without having to go somewhere else. Um, and then extending capability, you know, we saw some of the, the capability around Azure Monitor logging, uh, but that's, that's part of what you want to do. And the management in Windows Admin Center to be able to uh, connect into third-party vendor uh, solutions or extensions. So from a, if you're interested to, to make a start, uh, you can head on to uh, Azure Monitor. There's some great documentation there from Microsoft about how to enable that. I didn't go through that part of it today. If you have an Azure subscription, um, you can go ahead and enable an Azure Monitor workspace, creates the Log Analytics workspace for you. If you don't have an Azure subscription, you can sign up for a trial subscription. Uh, I think you get one month uh free with about 230 australian dollars worth of um, azure resources to use and at the end of that there is an ongoing um, component of azure services that are available free um, far more limited of course but um, the capability of you just to get in there enable the extension on an azure server or install the agent on an on-premises server and have a look have a play see what information you get have a look at the value that it can offer you uh, from a Windows Admin Center point of view, head across to aka.ms slash Windows Admin Center. You can download the, uh, I want to say technical preview, but we're calling it Windows Insider version uh, now, or the, the release version. Go ahead and install that on one of the supported servers. Um, just point it, if you've got permissions, point it at one of the servers that you want to manage. Uh, have a look around, uh, see, what you, see what you can do. Uh, very easy to get going on that. That's all I wanted to cover off today. So thank you very much for your, for your time and for your attention. I uh, hope it was of value to you. As I mentioned at the, the start, the session's uh, being recorded and that'll be available at jasco.net.au slash stay in the loop. Thank you very much. And if we have any questions, feel free to either pop them into the, the chat window or, or take yourself off mute.
Do we, do we have a question, Helen? Sorry, I, I missed that uh, pop up in the, the chat window. Uh, costings, a question around costings. Um, you notice that usual monitoring has a cost uh, estimate of a dollar fifty. Yeah, that, so that was a uh, when we were looking at the um, the notifications uh, in Azure Monitor. So they they try and estimate based on the so there's some analysis going on in the background. Microsoft are trying to estimate what the cost of that notification would be. Um, there's a there's a page I can shoot through um, to you. I don't have that off the top of my head, which explains. Kind of the costing per notification. I think out of the box you get something like uh, ten thousand uh, on the standard plan. I think you get ten thousand emails out of Azure Monitor at, at no additional cost. Um, there is a section which I, I might just see if I can flick across to quickly now um, that that tells you usage and estimated costs. Uh, so in my environment where I had those four servers. And I'm feeding in that that you know reasonably rich service map information, performance metrics. Um, I'm also looking at the event log for a bunch of common security logs. Uh, so the estimated uh, cost you can see there for the month for those four machines is eight dollars and fifty six cents. So it does depend on the amount of data ingested um, as to what the cost will be. Uh, and it does depend on the server role and, and how many logs it's generating and the size of those logs that you're ingesting into Azure Monitor as to uh, what, what that cost uh, will be. So domain controllers, uh, if you're enabled, enabling security logging or you're doing more advanced logging, uh, that ingestion will be higher and then the cost per gigabyte, um, the cost is based on per gigabyte, I should say, and that, that will increase. Uh, for the Windows Admin Center, there is there is no cost to that. If you are running Windows Server right now, you can just go ahead and download Windows Admin Center and start using it. I hope that answers the question. I have another question. Does the certificate module of Admin Center allow for any notifications of expiring certificates or do you have to connect and look at it? OK, so the Windows Admin Center is um, not trying to do the um, the notification components, but if that event is being filtered up into uh, an event log, uh, then Azure Monitor uh, will be able to tell me about that. If I'm feeding that information from if I've integrated uh, Windows Admin Center, or the, although I don't need to, I can install the Azure Monitor uh, agent onto a server to collect event information. And so I can then create an alert on expiring certificates um, because there will be an event generated in the event log that tells me about uh, expiring certificates on that server. And so I can filter that up that way, create a um, uh, an alerting uh, query, or sorry, a, a log query in Azure Monitor and then create an alert based on that. So if I see an alert for an, a, if I see an event for an expiring certificate, it will then take some action on that. And so the bit that uh, we were talking about there in Windows Admin Center and certificates, which I did skip over, I didn't, we didn't go and have a look at certificates. We can, we've got the capability to see, but natively the notification happens somewhere else. And I didn't realize how many expired certificates I had on my test environment. All right, we've got, uh, we've got another minute. So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to either type them into the, the chat window or to uh, take yourself off mute. All right, I've got no other questions, so thank you very much everyone. Um, 
Oh, sorry, one one question just before I close off. Um, saying, asking a lot of people disable remote PowerShell and WinRM for security reasons. Uh, for security, admin centers seem to require both of these to be able to run. Um, to a degree, it depends. You could, um, if you're concerned about enabling um, Windows uh, PowerShell and Windows Remote Management, uh, you can go ahead and limit that um, via your firewall to only allow the Windows Admin Center Gateway Server to be able to connect in to, to those. So um, as with anything, there's a balance between functionality and, and security. Um, and if you're concerned about the security for PowerShell and WinRM on all of the servers, then limit that uh, to the gateway server. So uh, if you remember, there was a, a graphic fairly early on in the presentation that showed that flow that uh, clients connect to the Windows Admin Center gateway. Um, and then the gateway is the server that communicates via PowerShell and WinRM to the servers that you're, you're managing. All right, I might uh, wrap it up there. Thank you very much again, everyone, for joining. Uh, we'll uh, post the recording shortly and hopefully talk to you again soon.